as long as I can remember, he was always involved very passionately in developing thoracic surgery. And in the beginning, right from the laparoscopic 92 era, we met him as a laparoscopic surgeon, then watch came in, and then further advances. Then he has been awarded BC Roy honors. He has been president of ASI and, and his year, there has been a lot of uh, educational activity in ASI. From All India Institute, he started Institute of Thoracic Sciences in Sir Gangaram Hospital, where he stayed for a few years. And for a year or so, he is chairman for uh, Thoracic Surgery Division in Medicity. His contribution as a passionate surgeon, a very dedicated teacher to thoracic surgery are commendable. He had started the first formal program of thoracic surgery in Sir Gangaram Hospital once he started uh, working there with national boards. Before his endeavor, thoracic has been always nobody's baby. It is above the slippers of general surgeons and it is not the interest of CTVS surgeons. So thoracic revival in India on a residency fellowship basis, Professor Arvind Kumar deserves all the credit. So with this brief introduction, I would introduce to you Professor Arvind Kumar. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you, my elder brother, Dr. G.D. Sharma. Good evening, all the esteemed panelists, participants from across the globe. Allow me to say that I consider it a singular honor to be addressing all of you, or rather sharing with all of you my thoughts on thoracic surgery from as prestigious a platform as this one. I knew about it for a long time, but I was really pleased to learn just a few minutes back that it's the largest platform of surgeons across the world, and more importantly, it's growing at a very rapid pace. It won't be an exaggeration to say that it's actually the result of the years and years of selfless hard work done by creator of this group, Dr. Sharma, very, very ably supported by Dr. Ilango, Dr. Patta Radhakrishna, Dr. Vidya, Dr. Virender, Dr. Prathapan, and so many others who have contributed to the growth of this excellent platform. I think all of them deserve a big round of applause since we can't applaud on this Zoom platform. So I would just say, sir, I'm indeed humbled to be addressing this platform and uh, really, really congratulate you for the huge almost impossible task that you have made possible by your sincere hard work. Friends, for me, as Dr. Sharma said, thoracic surgery is not a profession. It's a passion. It's a love affair which started long, long, long ago. And unlike many love affairs of these days, this love affair continues. So when I discussed with Dr. Sharma and we just discussed this idea of talking about thoracic surgery as a career in the current scenario, I was thrilled with joy and I said, certainly I would be happy 
to share this experience. But before I go to discussing that, I'll just take a few minutes and just add a few more lines to what Dr. Sharma said. Yes, I started my career at All India Institute in 76 and joined as a faculty in 88. I was very well ensconced in general surgery, but right in the beginning, and I want to mention one name who actually has brought me into this field, and that's my revered teacher, Professor T.K. Chattopadhyay, the well-known esophageal surgeon. He's my mentor, friend, philosopher, guide, guru, everything, all that I do today, I owe to him. Because of him, I developed this interest in thoracic surgery. Initially, it was under his umbrella that I initiated into this branch. Later on, he said, well, move on and courtesy large number of fellowships which I could manage because I was in institute, this grew into a love affair. Mm -hmm. Initially open surgery, then bad surgery, then added robotic surgery, and then there was this craving that, okay, whatever I have learned, this needs to be passed on to the next generation. And I want to share an experience which many of you will find it amusing that I wanted to start a training program. And due to some reasons, the training program was not getting started at AIMS because AIMS had a cardiothoracic training program. And I was asking for a thoracic training program, which was not getting done. And can you imagine that somebody resigns from the post of professor of surgery at the All India Institute and moves to a private institution to start an academic program, but such are things in life. So in 2012, I quit AIMS and joined Gangaram Hospital. And by grace of God, within one and a half years, country's first DNB thoracic surgery started at Gangaram, as Sir has mentioned. After that, we had brilliant students joining us, and many of them then joined us as uh, faculty colleagues, and the family started growing. And again, in 2020, I faced a similar dilemma. Everything was going beautiful, but then we were growing as a family and we needed a bigger place to, for everyone to be able to grow. And again, we took a leap of faith and left Gangaram Hospital to move to our current abode, which is Medanta Hospital. Just a few anecdotes to, to, to discuss with you or to share with you this journey of 30 years. So the slides are visible? Yes, sir. Okay. Good. So I'll be discussing in the next 20 minutes or so the scope of thoracic surgery in the current scenario. And I bring you greetings from all my colleagues, Dr. Bilal, Dr. Harsh, Dr. Sukram, Dr. Mohan, Dr. Vivek, and Dr. Sumit, seven of us here in the department, and also my very esteemed anesthesia colleagues led by Dr. Sangeeta. Greetings to all of you. When I looked at the uh, National Medical Commission website, the erstwhile MCI, for the super specialty courses one can do after general surgery, we find these 16 surgical specialties which are available today from CTVS, neurosurgery, plastic surgery, onco, GI, hepatobiliary, pediatric urology, endocrine trauma, minimal access, head and neck, and breast vascular, and thoracic surgery. Now, I was, I was wondering from where to start this talk, and I thought that when one has to choose his career, if you look at all the people and divide them into different, different groups, how people choose, I found two types of people. Those who make a decision on an emotional basis and those who make the decision on a rational basis. Now, who are these emotional people? They are diehard fans of a specialty or a super specialty. Now, this diehard fanship could be because of some uh, incidents in their childhood, some belief, some story, whatever it could be. But they are kind of fit. No, I have to do this only. And there's no way they can be persuaded to change. So they are diehard fans, emotional people. They do what they wish to do. 
that's a separate group this number is small but more in number are people who do rational thinking and when one does rational thinking to choose his career what are the points you look at now there are about seven points you look at number one is the specialty exciting are there good training centers is there enough disease burden to be able to give me a successful career how much of minimal invasive work is there because this is a very important aspect of life of a surgeon today is the training difficult what are the job opportunities and what are the challenges now let's look at thoracic surgery on all of these points so number one how is the specialty is it exciting or no well for times immemorial thoracic surgery has been considered synonymous with tuberculosis everybody says oh thoracic surgery means tuberculosis friends this is the first myth i want to bust that there is a huge amount of disease load which is present starting from lung where you have huge number of cancer cases lung cancer and then whole lot of benign diseases from post tubercular problems to bronchiectasis to all kinds of cystic lesions pneumothorax sequestration there is a whole gamut of diseases from lung you come to mediastinum anterior mediastinum posterior mediastinum middle mediastinum cystic lesions solid lesions benign tumors cancers you come to pleura pleural effusion chylothorax empyema tuberculosis a mesothelioma the whole lot of pleural diseases tracheobronchial tree this corona has suddenly led to increase in lot of tracheal diseases and otherwise also with more and more people surviving in icus we have a lot of tracheal stenosis there are tracheal tumors and now with trauma increasing we are facing more and more cases of tracheal trauma also in esophagus there are benign diseases there are cancerous diseases there is trauma all kinds of diseases diaphragm we all thought that diaphragm means only diaphragmatic hernia but there are numerous diseases diaphragm eventration we recently had a paper on this chest wall chest wall may be involved in trauma chest wall may have tumors chest wall may have tuberculosis and most importantly now with trauma increasing in numbers chest is a very important but sadly very neglected part of the trauma management and mind you most of the on spot deaths which occur are due to chest trauma so chest trauma management is a very important part of overall trauma management so friends you would see that unlike what it was considered in the past chest surgery today has a gamut of diseases and this number unfortunately or fortunately is increasing very very rapidly friends last two decades belong to the heart but next two decades clearly belong to the lungs and other chest diseases very clear no confusion about it next 20 years it's the chest 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 which is going to be the center of attraction now this was about the gamut of diseases how do we access these diseases so we do conventional open surgery which could be by thoracotomy sternotomy bilateral clamshell hemi clamshell all kinds of incision are there but that's not the end we have thoracoscopic surgery minimally invasive which is about 75% of our workload which could be from simple nodule excision to wedge excisions to lobectomy to pneumonectomy to any and every procedure which could be under general anesthesia or conscious sedation to now a big non intubated surgery so the whole range of procedures that we can do and this is my colleague dr mohan performing a wax procedure and this is actually truly a delight the difference between laparoscopy and laparotomy and the difference between thoracoscopy and thoracotomy if you compare the difference in the chest is many 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 times more than that in the abdomen so this is about wax but that's not all we added robotic surgery in 2008 so this where you first make these incisions and then you get this robot earlier everybody thought that robot was only for abdomen but there are large number of applications and some where clearly 
robot is the better procedure than bats or open procedure. So that's my colleague, Dr. Bilal, who's performing this robotic surgery. So you have this robot surgery, which is available. And I'm happy to share that in thoracic surgery, this is actually one of the largest experiences that we have. And it's very, very satisfying. You first come and do the docking. And after the docking is completed, then you remove your gloves and gown and just go and sit on the console. And on the, on the comfort of console, you carry out robotic surgery. Of course, you have to have an able team on the bedside to be able to help you out. So you can do an open surgery, you can do back surgery, you can do robotic surgery, depending on the indication. Doesn't mean just because you have robot, everything will be by robot. Yes, <coughs> all this range is available and you can do all these things. So we can do, we have huge number of diseases and we have all the methods available to do. So is the specialty exciting? Well, unequivocal answer, yes, it is very exciting. Next point, is there a high disease burden? Well, if you look at the incidence of tuberculosis, we have the highest incidence in our country in the world. So that gets us a lot of post-tubercular problem, not just tuberculosis, but a lot of post-tubercular problem. In addition, if you look at the causes of that, and this is from global burden of disease, earlier cardiovascular diseases had constitute one fourth and respiratory was 13%. But I can tell you in the next five years, these numbers are going to get up. In the next 10, 20 years, this number will be increasing by leaps and bounds, and this number will be going down. Then if you look at comparison, this is again from GBD. When you look at the status in 2007 and compare it to 2017, you find all the chest diseases are increasing. And when you look at the COPD, LRTI, tuberculosis, and lung cancer across the globe, you find this is the highest incidence, and you find India to be in this red zone on all the diseases. And this is despite a lot of underreporting which takes place in India. So compared to the rest of the world, we have a very, very high disease burden. And next 20 years, this burden is going to increase in a rapid manner. So is there enough disease burden for us? Yes, there is enough disease burden. Next point, how much minimally invasive work is there? Well, today in our unit, we do about 90 to 100 cases a month. 75% of this is minimal access, which could be VATS or robotic. And therefore, if you have spent a lot of time in training in laparoscopy during your three years of general surgery, or maybe you've done senior residency, that experience will not go waste because the application is the same. If you know these laparoscopy principles well, you will be able to apply in the test. So how much minimal invasive work is there? Well, there is lots of it and it's continuously increasing. Next question, is the training difficult? A lot of people ask this, oh, this training must be very difficult, very rigorous. Well, I would like to share just this first line. No game without pain. If you want to be a super, super specialist, dealing with a myriad of diseases occurring in the chest, You've got to train well to be able to handle them. And if you want to train well, you've got to spend those endless number of hours in the ward for which you need to spend time there. You need to tolerate pain. That only will lead to pain. Nothing is difficult if one wants to achieve it without labor, nothing prospers. So yes, the training is difficult, but once you cross that training, it is indeed a mesmerizing experience. It takes time to understand and imbibe the concepts of this specialty. But friends, I can vouch for it that once you imbibe these in your system, one cannot just ex exclaiming about how beautiful it is. As you go deeper and deeper into this field, you tend to fall in love with it. An affair that lasts a lot of time, and I am the example who has quit two places to just increase the specialty, increase the specialty. So 
Training is difficult. Yes, it's hard training. But after that hard training is a beautiful, mesmerizing experience waiting for you. Last point, what job opportunities are there? Well, plenty of job opportunities are there across the country. Sadly, there are no takers. Every hospital in the country has realized that it's an upcoming specialty and people want this specialty to be developed in their hospital. There are no well-trained, completely trained thoracic surgeons. There are a large number of people who are doing thoracic surgery. So doing thoracic surgery is not synonymous with being a complete, well-trained thoracic surgeon. I'm talking of complete, well-trained thoracic surgeon who can handle A to Z, everything that I mentioned in that list. When you are a well-trained thoracic surgeon, complete training, you go and join any hospital, you'd probably be starting as an HOD, and you would have the task at your hand to set up that department. And if you wish to start this specialty, you will be an undisputed pioneer. You can see the number of well-trained, complete thoracic surgeons is a minuscule number when you compare it with the super specialists in n number of other specialties. So there are plenty of job opportunities across the country, but there are challenges. And challenges are that it's a totally, totally neglected, undeveloped specialty in the country, and it's not a single person isolated specialty. It's a specialty where team is the most important. You've got to have your colleagues from surgery, chest surgery, from anesthesia, from the nursing side, from the technician side, from the ICU side, from the post of care in the ward side. It's a complete teamwork which is there. And you've got to develop this manpower. So a lot of times people come to us, sir, I'm the surgeon, I want to get trained. I tell him, first thing, please go and get your anesthetist also. Without a trained anesthetist, thoracic surgeon cannot exist. So there is a lot of teamwork which is required. Sometimes affordability may be an issue, but that's not a major issue. Training opportunities as of today are still limited because it's not being done at very many centers and it requires institute with well-equipped ICU setup and you need a robust anesthesia and also a robust pulmonology backup. So once you have all these backups and you've been able to set up your system, then I think there is nothing that can stop you from cruising high speed. So challenges are there, but they can all be overcome if you are committed to start this specialty. So some of the, uh, I, I'm nearing the end of my presentation. So why should I choose thoracic surgery? Well, it's a rare, rare breed. Why do I use this word rare breed? Because there is rarity of thoracic surgeons. As I said, if you count all those 16 specialties, the least number of surgeons in the country, brain surgeons, are in thoracic surgery. So it's a rarity as far as availability of brain people are concerned. There is plenty of availability of patients. There is reproducibility of the surgical technique. If you teach well to your students and if your students have learned it well, they will be then able to start this flame, continue this flame, and spread this knowledge far and wide. So there is reproducibility and most important, since you may be the only person in your entire region or state who's doing it, there is a certain amount of exclusivity of this specialty. So this makes it a rare, rare breed. And I call upon all of you, won't you like to be one amongst this rare, rare species? So my take-home message, friends, is that it's a neglected specialty. There is a huge gap between the demand and supply. There is a large patient load of TB, cancer, and host of other diseases. The indications are ever expanding, and the spectrum is ever expanding. And it's a beautiful, beautiful branch. It is waiting for dedicated, hardworking, passionate individuals to come and fall in love with. I would like to say work 
work hard be kind and amazing things will unfold in front of you the best way to predict your future is to create it and joining pursuing a career in thoracic surgery is one of the best ways to predict and create your future and last not about thoracic surgery but about approach towards life in general we are living in a very materialistic kind of world everybody wants to be successful and everybody wants to be successful overnight you join tomorrow tomorrow you want to be a star so there is a craving for chasing success friends i would like to leave with this message please don't chase success make excellence as your destination chase excellence but don't chase excellence just like that chase excellence as a fire burning within you whatever i will do i will do in an excellent manner i will do nothing except excellence i will exist for nothing except excellence friends if you have this fire for excellence burning within you i promise success will be at your feet thank you very much all of you for your precious time and in case there are any questions i'll be more than happy to answer over to you dr sharma uh, professor arvin could you just stop sharing your screen please sir thank you sir thank you very much uh, professor arvind kumar it has been a ex excellent uh, description for the youngsters to be promoted into the specialty uh, i do have some memories of having worked for 7 years with professor eggleston who brought uh, thoracic to india as back as 1953 and uh, well those days the thoracic was very primitive but within the circumstances he used to teach all his fifth year trainees quite a bit of basic principles of open thoracic and i fully agree one of the common saying which i would like to quote which uh, dr eggleston used to highlight is he has seen more complications from a chest tube insertion than a lobectomy because lobectomy is done by trained people and chest tube everybody wants to insert with or without training so today there is a need you have really highlighted uh, would for the benefit of uh, house would you like to share with us the structure of training when you have a new dnb resident a uh, sorry fellow in thoracic what is the structure part of the training in first year in second year in Third year. What is the level of uh, competence rise with each year in the department? That will be very sure. nice. Sure, that's an excellent question, sir. Uh, but before I question, I answer the question. I would like to comment on your comment about chest tube, sir. From morning till night, if there is one sentence which I keep repeating hundred times every day, it is that if you want chest care across the country to improve. just go travel across the country and teach safe chest tube insertion to one and all if you have taught how to insert the chest tube safely i think 80% of the average level thoracic surgery work is done and trust me sir we are really passionate about sharing this and we've been doing this classes and everything and not only amongst doctors i'm happy to share that just last saturday we had a, a conference organized for nurses from across the country nearly 4000 nurses from across the country joined on a zoom platform and we shared the secrets of a safe chest tube insertion and more importantly maintenance with them so it's a passion for us and i 100% agree that if one can put and maintain a chest tube and remove a chest tube safely i think a large part of thoracic surgery is done now coming to your program your question sir the 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 structure is that sir there are few uh, points that i am extremely passionate about one is asepsis in the ot 
two is about how you conduct yourself and the etiquettes and all other things and since we have people coming from all over they may have had different kinds of training so the first three months are pure observership you come you be in the ward just get adjusted to the ward to the work culture then you come and just stand in the theater and get adjusted let me teach there are few things which i teach them again even if it means repetition of the basic principles of the presidency now having ensured that this is done the next thing that starts and this is done immediately thereafter is the safe chest tube insertion part and then they start being the second assistants in various procedures be it open surgery vat surgery or robotic surgery of course comes much later in the third year so the first year will be devoted to learning the basic skills of chest surgery which starts from the chest tube goes to various thoracotomies putting support and introducing the camera making the system ready but more important than that is learning the 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 ot skills including the anesthesia part how to react if there is a problem while you are having the patient anesthetized there are different situations during surgery when suddenly saturation starts falling and one needs to react so they are grilled to become used to responding to those emergency situations so by end of first year this is completed when you come to second year then you start doing procedures like decortication simple nodule excisions and these kind of procedures yourself more and more of assistance in major procedures and start starting to do these procedures and when you are in final year before you pass out i would expect them to be able to start the vax procedure put the ports start the mobilization of the lung now there is a lot of controversy about vax lobectomy everybody wants to be proficient in vax lobectomy before they complete their mcx slash dnb third year i'm very clear that vax lobectomy is an extremely advanced procedure for to be given when a lot of experience even i have you know sometimes fears when i'm doing this procedure so that's not but certainly the steps of that procedure should be known you should be able to assist and little bit starting should be there but they should be proficient in open lobectomy things like pneumonectomy chest wall little bit of resection empyema is something they should be able to handle pneumothorax is something they should be able to handle if there are other kinds of tumors they should be able to start the procedure and know all the steps so when the person finishes he is actually initiated very well into the art and craft of this and i always insist that they stay back couple of years thereafter before we can certify now you are ready to go and start practicing as a stand alone surgeon i hope i have answered oh very nice uh dr lingo wants to know like in all specialties there is crossover so gi guys would complain i mean put their right on esophagus the day the trauma the general surgeons would like to take over easy diaphragm chest wall when it is a easy chest wall injury everybody wants to put his hand on so see yours is a very different situation you have through your hard work excellence consistent effort gone up the ladder but what about a youngster when he joins a corporate hospital as a thoracic surgeon he 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 would be pulled from several sides uh what is your take on that sir my answer is very simple and trust me i believe and practice what i am going to say you should learn the procedures well passionately and do them well passionately deliver results and trust me if you don't run after numbers but run after leaving a well recovered happy patient <coughs> happy family and happy administration sir believe me there will be no dearth of patients for you there may be n number of general surgeons practicing trauma but if you deliver sir the patients will come to you 
there may be n number of gi surgeons wanting to take away stop figure but when they are in trouble you go help them out bail them out you will be an unpleasant thing of the stop figure sir there is no dearth of numbers in our country you just have to chase excellence and trust me numbers will chase you i agree with you this is this is something like i am reminded of uh, john p blandy who separated out urology from general surgery in england and uh, way back uh, in 70s you know he enunciated a very important thing which uh, besides a teacher i am also a part time preacher so i, I tell a lot of uh, young souls who are frustrated i said john p blandy said if you know everything stay there for 5 years and the results would come don't expect sure. that you are done i'm seeing in urology tomorrow every circumcision will start coming to you because there will be somebody in the crowd who would say oh i started doing this procedure when he was in his undergarments he didn't join his kindergarten school so there will be some people but then first point is they are not that thoroughly trained number 2 anybody who is organ based surgeon or a system based surgeon has to perform over the time better than a old uh, journalist and the patients should be there that is and you continue your consistent work and i would also like to share one thing since a lot of thoracic procedures have reasonable morbidity so it will be good uh, idea to incorporate in the system because patient with morbidity need to be taken care with lot of compassion and good communication a surgeon who can communicate well to the family pre operatively intra after the surgery and during the morbidity he retains his patient for much longer time so would you have ever considered uh, adding some uh, communication sessions to your uh, dnb or mch residents sir uh, they may not be very specified communication session but there are couple of things which my colleagues keep hearing from me the day they join so first stress is on asepsis i mean i'm really brutal as far as asepsis is concerned the next is care for the patient i always say that living or dying is not in our hands that something will happen but if somebody dies for want of care it's a crime let's put our best efforts to look after the patient and after that if he dies well we can't change it but let no one die for want of care sir another thing that i have found very useful because you mentioned about communication is to be absolutely open up front to the patient tell the truth sir re in reality many a times we tend to underrate the complication and overrate our success stories because you don't want the patient to go away my approach is i would rather let a few patients go away and have the rest very happy you under promise and over deliver you will leave a satisfied patient if you do the other way round you will need to improve your communication skills sir very 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 good we we think absolutely alike on that if out of 10 people who come and uh, one or two don't go back then probably my selection and communication is not uh, adequate as i i think about it and uh, professor shinai has a very interesting question he wants to know on one end there is lot of scope for uh, this rare incoming speciality but despite of this the top boys are not opting for it maybe there are less centers maybe there is less awareness maybe some people think well that used to be a ancient thinking that thoracic is usually the bulk of thoracic patients are poor from poorer section of society 
what what is your take on that why the boys are not taking it yes sir so i i accept what dr shinoy has said and <coughs> it's actually not no single reason it's a combination of factors first of all yes there is a belief that most of it is actually tuberculosis patients will be infected they will all be poor there is no money there's no glamour in it moreover so this is one part there is a general belief like that second part is that yes it's true that across the country you have 200 plus cardio thoracic training centers but you have just a few thoracic training centers and ours happens to be one of them so therefore the the opportunities are limited more importantly the awareness is limited and i'm sure as the awareness increases the people come to know that there is so much of scope for it the i think more and more people will join everybody used to go towards heart but you've seen that now that craving towards heart is reducing because the heart diseases are reducing so therefore next 20 years belonging to lung diseases should be a reason for more and more people to be joining it sir uh, so gds sir if i can uh, step in sure, here sure. Uh, we have yes, uh, professor sure. subarao <clears throat> Uh, who was a professor in HOD of cardiothoracic surgery in Jitma Pondicherry, later director. So I want to know from him, the being a cardiac surgeon, who has done a lot of thoracic surgery. Start with why do cardiac surgeons? Why did they ditch uh, thoracic surgery and uh, stuck to cardiac surgery only? Professor Bar. Uh, well, uh, if we can see you, sir. We can't see you. Uh, let me see whether I can put on my. my video can you see? yes sir yes uh, thank you very much uh, dr pata i think after a long time i could hear a thoracic surgeon speaking about thoracic surgery that's why it attracted me and then i i logged in uh, i know that when i started uh, i i joined jipmer as a general surgeon registrar in general surgery then i was accidentally put in the department of thoracic surgery where there was no thoracic surgeon working at the time and then i had no choice to continue only in that department dr sen who was uh, assistant professor of surgery who did frc years in 1947 the uh, year of my birth he was heading the department and he was doing all sorts of surgery because those days there were not many specialties so he was doing thoracic neuro and many other specialties himself neither he was trained thoracic surgeon nor i had any exposure to thoracic surgery then i had to do initially you know rigid endoscopies and i know that we used to perforate the esophagus while doing the rigid endoscopy but then what happened is i do not agree with the uh, uh, vijay sharma saying upcoming specialty this is not an upcoming specialty it is a very very old specialty in fact uh, the thoracic surgery was the only specialty initially along with neuro surgery as a super specialty but the point is that uh, still the cardiac surgery has joined till it became uh, cardio thoracic and vascular surgery all the centers were doing only thoracic work maybe not much as uh, arvind told that most of them are empyema bronchiectasis lung divisions lung surgery mediastinal tumors etc but then uh, i think to gain more and more opportunities they were doing with pediatric surgery like you know diaphragmatic hernia esophago bronchial fistulas all those things because you know to get uh, more and more but then once cardiac surgery has come up and people started doing open heart surgery i think uh, thoracic surgery has uh, died a natural death there is no question about it because uh, any, any day i think cardiac surgery is more glamorous more remunerative less strenuous though there may be stress but less strenuous i can say if you have to do a lobectomy or a nephrectomy in those days you used to work almost for 6 to 8 hours from morning to evening and then after that patient used to have bronchopleural fistula and all sorts of complications and then uh, the though there is no mortality there used to be very high morbidity so they are not very very you know lucrative branch 
and then uh, now uh, to combat that uh, people started doing uh, bats and then you know thoracoscopic thoracosco surgery but i can say that i mean i i, I am not uh, in touch with uh, surgery these days i have retired more than 10 years ago but in the infective cases uh, like bronchiectasis and then you know uh, tuberculosis nowadays tuberculosis is not there but uh, infective cases i i don't know how how far they could uh, do these uh, vats but uh, tumors which are confined only to you know stage 1 or at the most stage 2 i think uh, it can be done but then uh, the another point is the uh, arvind kumar is only one arvind kumar why not uh, 50 to 100 arvind kumars then only i think arvind kumar started in 76 but even 2022 not even 10 or 15 you know arvind kumar is never country to doing uh, doing thoracic surgery to that level then how anybody can train unless you have more number of trained thoracic surgeons with a training program i don't think we'll be able to train these students second thing is however much you say remuneration is definitely 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 much much less when compared to because most of these patients are poor very few people are probably you know unlike cardiac surgery you do a ca bg most of them are rich and they are prepared to pay any amount and cardiac surgery means you know it gives a thrill also so the students and people are not getting attracted to this branch uh in spite of all that the morbidity and mortality has not much altered unlike cardiac surgery cardiac surgery initially it used to be very high mortality but now it has come down very much now they say it is comparable to appendectomy but i don't think in thoracic surgery the morbidity or mor- mortality has changed that much so all these factors still remain and i doubt Uh, whether it can still take up because general surgeons are not capable of doing it thoracic surgeons so called cardio thoracic surgeons are not taking interest in thoracic surgery and in 1983 when i joined for my mch dr valiyadan wanted to separate all the three because the, he said that it is impossible to, in, to create interest in thoracic surgery unless you separate it out thoracic cardiac and vascular he wanted three to be separated but at that time mca did not agree and afterwards vascular surgery got separated and then they are doing quite well because of the endovascular surgery i think it has come up like very much but thoracic surgery still remains like that i don't think much of a change has occurred from those days right 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 when arvind started in 76 excepting for the fact that vats has become much more you know easier for certain other conditions especially thoracic trauma i think it is a very very good tool without opening the chest you will be able to diagnose and probably even create uh, you know uh, some uh, procedures can be done uh, without much of morbidity so i still feel that unless and otherwise we have more aravan kumars i don't think this speciality will come up as such as a independent speciality uh, I, i i can't add anything more i am very happy that aravan kumar had come up and then in stimulating and uh, Uh, i could have shown some of his results so that they would uh, encourage the students to take it up is robotic surgical you know results and then the results of other uh, procedures which he has done over so many years uh, i think that has uh, definitely uh, you know stimulated more and more people to take it up but i am happy that at least you know there is a you have taken a lead so that this so called dying specialty will again get reborn rather than saying that upcoming or incoming speciality it is one of the oldest specialties i can say and those days there is no no opportunity there is no other way that's why they were doing thoracic surgery once cardiac surgery has come up there are hundreds of cardiac surgical centers in our own country excellent centers with excellent results but why thoracic surgery is not coming up i think with this i will stop no, sir, you can ask the responder you lot of uh, controversies sir no 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 <laughs> i i'm sorry if i if i said anything against what no. you have said arvind kumar it is not that but still i say uh, i have heard lot about you about your department even in aims because uh, ctvs students used to come to your department to learn thoracic surgery venugopal never used to do any thoracic work at least stanley john used to do some thoracic work in velour but those days uh, 
uh, that when the boss is not interested naturally the other people will not be interested at least you have uh, you know rescued the mummy of those post graduates at least they know how to do a bronchoscopy and other things but nowadays uh, nobody uh, dr arvind we are unable to hear you uh... okay. Hello? Yes, sir. Me? Yes, sir. Can I can I respond to what sir said? Please do, sir. Please do. Okay. So first of all, I, my, my I, I, I'll very talk to you sincere, later. Very sincere. I will talk to you later. I'm in a Zoom meeting. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Sir, my humble and sincere regards to Professor Subarao. He's a doyen of cardiothoracic surgery in our country. I agree with everything that he has said because these are golden words. I uh, uh, take them as blessings. There are just three points on which I would like to very humbly and politely disagree. Number one, sir, the, just as you said in cardiac surgery, the morbidity mortality has reduced significantly. And I'm happy to share with you that, sir, in thoracic surgery also, the morbidity mortality has reduced significantly, significantly. Uh, you mentioned about my showing some results. Sir, I deliberately did not show the results because in our department, we have a very, very strong push for publications. And I'm really happy to share with you, sir, that in the last two years of Corona time, where the work was slightly dipped, the whole department, all seven of us consultants sat down and we have 50 plus publications in indexed journals. And these journals range from Lung India to Indian Journal of Surgical Oncology to Annals of Thoracic Surgery. 50 publications in indexed journals in the last two years is the academic output from our department. So everything that we do from m -pyma to robotic lobectomy, everything has been reported in the literature, it's available on the internet. That was the reason I didn't uh, uh, show the results here. And third thing that I disagree, sir, is that it's not remunerative. Now, I cannot be disclosing my check here, but I would only say, <laughs> sir, it is very, very remunerative, very, very satisfying, no less than my cardiac surgeons in Medanta. Dr. Patta. Well, that's very heartening to know, sir, and a hearty congratulations for 50 publications in two years. I don't know of any other uh, department, uh, any other. Uh, Dr. Patta, 50 publications in the last two years. Otherwise, if you take thoracic surgery, we have over 80 publications in the last 10 years in the field of thoracic, but these 50 publications are in the last two years, and I I attribute this, I completely to my very able colleagues in the department who have done all the writing work. It's a tribute to them. Sir, so, uh, a word about- but, uh, one, one point I want to just uh, yes, you know, respond to. I never wanted to demean the work that is done by Aravind Kumar. I have a lot of regard for him. He has done a great surgery and great service for the thoracic surgery. It is my, in fact, it is my first love to do thoracic surgery than cardiac surgery because I was trained in thoracic surgery only even before cardiac surgery has come up. We were doing only PDA and then uh, you know that how our open heart surgery program started. Sure, it is only sure. after 15 years of my, you know, sure. getting training in thoracic surgery. But what I want to say is that somehow it is not really coming up. That is yes, what sir. my my anguish. Jesus. It is not that I am against thoracic surgery, sure. sir. I am sure. very much interested in thoracic surgery. Even if suppose, in fact, uh, many 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 of my own relations got uh, operated. When somebody asked me, you tell me a best center of thoracic surgery in our country. I cannot name even a five centers. Sure, sir. With, uh, you know, you have started at least Medanta Hospital, but how many people can reach Medanta Hospital and sure, then? Sir. And you know, that is the problem. When I said remuneration, it is not that you are getting a remuneration, but a person who just starts his career in thoracic surgery, he will take more than 10 to 15 years to reach, you know, even one 50th of your stage. 
and then you know in nowadays uh, nobody would wait for such a long time whereas you ask patta if somebody takes you know surgical gastroenterology cholecystectomy he will uh, you know laparoscopic cholecystectomy he will learn in no time and then so many cases he will get and he can earn much more this is the problem what i'm saying is uh, so, how, how you passion i agree that yes but people are looking at uh, all these points to take a speciality sir i i want to respond to this because it's a very sir i never said that you demeaned you only you only heaped praise on me sir and i'm indeed grateful to you what i want to say is sir this is a very pertinent point you have raised and there is a general belief that there is no money in thoracic surgery and sir i want to use this platform to dispel this belief the youngsters i do i can't name them but let me tell that the youngsters who are there in my team and in teams elsewhere are getting paid as well as the cardiac surgeons of the same age or gi surgeons or surgical oncologists of the same age so it's a wrong notion that it's an underpaid specialty it probably used to be but the way it is coming up now with the aura of diseases under its belt it is equally paying for all you know in times to come it may be better paid than cardiac surgery and many other surgeries so there is money there is satisfaction there is passion there is whole range there is a bright future sir can i call uh, professor shanai to uh, unmute and uh, give his comments sir uh, uh, dr patta uh, dr mishra had raised this question any scope of thoracic oncology fellowships post mch post dnb uh, well definitely this scope is there we do get requests from people for a specialized some want to do robotics some want to do surgical oncology i think scope is there as the numbers increase i think we should be able to cater to this requirement also professor shanai please uh, be before he comes in sir uh, I, i just want to have a, a query about uh, uh a lung transplantation as a part of thoracic surgery in the future what, what is your take on that? so lung transplant is a very important part of any thoracic surgery center uh anywhere in the world i actually trained in it way back in 1995 at ames i received a three months training in university of florida but because of some political issues it could not get started there in institute some political issue i don't want to bring that when i moved to gangaram there was a, because gangaram was a very strong transplant center and we thought we would start but what was happening was that we were traveling across the country trying to establish this specialty you know developing a network pulmonologists are so fond of saying oh there are no thoracic surgeons in our country there are no thoracic surgeons they would continue to keep the patients with themselves and not send to you so there was a lot of work which we needed to do to reach out to people to start getting that and we thought when we have limited time it's better to devote time to this specialty develop this specialty rather than go into a niche area of transplant and spend all your time there so that was the reason but over here now we are seven of us well ensconced in the department specialty is well accepted and i'm happy to share with you that we are having our inspection on coming monday we've already prepared everything for that and we have received our training part pulmonologist surgeon support staff everything is completed and god willing you should be hearing from us some good news in near future dr patta wonderful sir uh, ilango uh, for your comments sir am i am i audible yeah, my internet is a little unstable if i if it goes off just tell me i'll switch off the video so wonderful lecture uh, professor arvind kumar um, a lot of the top tips we have copied because we find it difficult to inspire uh, students at all times regarding different specialties and we are very happy to say that uh, that uh, your lecture will int in introduce thoracic surgery as one of the options for uh, uh, many of the surgeons 
because we we our idea is that we should we should get a lot of these uh, different specialties on board so that the next generation of surgeons can can face the problems that needs to be addressed in our public domain i had a few few more questions but sure. i think uh, it was all covered up yeah how did you manage the learning curve in your early days with with a very young team or something which i wanted to discuss which i would have really loved to know i would Can answer that in brief so uh, dr elango as i said i used to be part of general surgery department and this is something you will find very strange but i'm sharing the truth with you how i learned so dr chatterjee dr topadhyay the esophageal surgeon was my first teacher in thoracic surgery but obviously he being a esophageal surgeon his uh, uh, experience was limited and i started taking these fellowships so i visited almost 20 plus hospitals across us on various fellowships and learned these tips there i would come back and apply this knowledge here have problems note them down in my next trip next year on some other fellowships i would again go back there and solve it with them come back come back and this process continued from about 95 to 2005 and by 2005 we had a well set a kind of a situation in the department a robot was introduced in 2008 and that's when i started dreaming of a training program that whatever i have learned by traveling across the country and standing in the ots with a copy in my hand just noting like a small school child now how do i pass on this to next generation because as general surgery consultant i had my general surgery senior residents who would come to me for year and a half and by the time they learn a b c d of thoracic and start assisting me their term would be over and then a new batch will come so i never had a truly trained batch of assistants assisting me and everywhere i went they said you can only do advanced work if you have a team and that's why i was dreaming to have dnb or mch program which is what made me quit all india institute i never wanted to quit all india institute i quit it only only and only to be able to start a training program in thoracic surgery which by grace of god i could start at gangaram and when we moved to medanta the program has moved to medanta hospital with us so this is how we train and then of course we have the now our students who are there as colleagues and they are training and now of course it's a team with seven consultants so everything is very systematized now Dr. Elango, I hope I answered the question. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Um, thoracic surgery always has been an inspiration for every one of us. Um, I remember when when we were trained, I also had um, the opportunity to work in thoracic surgery because the cardiac surgery theater was closed when I was a general surgery student, and I enjoyed during uh, doing the pneumonectomies, taking care of patients. for uh, with these who underwent these ophthalmectomies and that is how i got introduced to complex surgery uh, this was my first posting so i still remember good things about thoracic surgery and i would encourage every student uh, to in 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 different specialties for example like um working with a cardiac surgeon even for a brief time will help you polish your vascular surgery skills which you may use in urology transplantation sometimes in gi surgery so um um every student must consider this option and i'm sure your lecture will be an inspiration for many students to choose thoracic surgery as a specialty of their choice thank you sir for being with us thank you very much i'm uh, back to uh, dr gds last uh, professor ravin kumar uh, a last question Uh, have you see even today the thoracic trauma and pleural disease constitutes quite a bit of case uh, load component for thoracic surgery have you mm -hmm. ever uh, i repeat thoracic trauma and uh, pleural disease constitutes still quite a big chunk of volume in yes. india yeah the training opportunities are limited have you ever considered 
training already people who are in practice in periphery or in a smaller units who take care as a first filter on thoracic trauma, which can save a lot of young lives. So would you have ever considered uh, a small three, four weeks exposure to such people who come and stay uh, near your place and work workplace and attend with you for uh, four weeks or eight weeks course, which can really change the mortality on ground while you are contributing so much. Educating people who are not privileged enough to be trained during their residency and are now 10, 15 year post uh, MS doing general surgery practice at a district level because I have strongly believed that the richest man is also a pauper in an emergency situation is trauma. Sure. Uh, would you ever consider that? Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question. Trust Dr. Sharma to ask a question which can actually truly be called an idea can change life. Uh, sir, I would like to share with you that chest tube insertion and management of trauma are two things that we have been extensively lecturing on by various means. Uh, and I always reached out to people that there is a talk that I often give, basics of thoracic surgical skills that every general surgeon must know. A common thing, you are doing a lap coli, you hit the diaphragm with a hook and there is a hole and a pneumothorax developed instantly. What do you do instantly? What should be your reaction? You know, those kind of situations we keep talking. So up till now, we have addressed this in the form of lectures. But sir, I take your suggestion very, very seriously. Fortunately, all my department colleagues also are logged in. And tomorrow morning itself, we are going to discuss this as the first thing. And trust me, in a week or 10 days time, I'll come back to you with a structured four weeks training program, basics of ICD insertion and trauma management that all general surgeons must know. And with the help of this platform and other seniors, we'll try and take it across the country, sir. That's a promise I make on this platform, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh... Thoracic anesthesia must be as difficult as thoracic surgery. I mean, uh, Vidya, what is uh, your uh, view about, because uh, the lungs are the ones you deal with and the lungs are the one that Aravin deals with also. What are the challenges and uh, I mean, what, any, any comments on that? So, like uh, Dr. Arvind has said right in the beginning, uh, thoracic surgery is, a real, I mean, everything is a teamwork, but I think thoracic surgery lifts the teamwork to another level and uh, uh, I, and uh, Dr. Arvind was kind enough to introduce his uh, anesthetist right at the beginning. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, working as a team is very important. Uh, 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 teams which are set will have much better results. Unlike, uh, I mean, I don't mean to demean any other type of surgery because I, I am an anesthetist who does uh, mostly non-cardiac work. But nevertheless, it may not be that, uh, uh, you know, important as to uh, whether the same anesthetist comes for every one of your lab police, but I am sure that for every one of his tracheal reconstructions, Dr. Arvind Kumar would like to have the same team uh, uh, working with him because uh, uh, the the Jugalbandi has to be perfect for uh, thoracic surgery. And uh, Dr. Arvind, thank you for that uh, really inspiring lecture. I'm I, I wish I were 20 years younger or 30 years younger. You you would have sold. Uh, uh, thoracic surgery to me. I might have become a surgeon just so that I could do thoracic surgery. So thank you so much. I'm sure the youngsters who are uh, watching it on Facebook and will be later watching it on YouTube will, uh, irrespective of which um, speciality they take up, uh, the passion of yours shines through and I'm sure it will inspire many of uh, the surgeons, anesthetists, even other doctors. Uh, uh, and uh, your the thing about always pursuing excellence is something uh, many of us try to, uh, you know, tell uh, our juniors. But the way you put it, sir, I think it will really make a big difference. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Girjandas Sharma, sir, for in bringing Dr. Arvind Kumar for our Let's Learn Surgery uh, 
uh, I mean, it was a really inspiring lecture and uh, I hope I get a chance to sometime visit uh, you in Medanta and watch your procedures. Uh, 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 Ilango, uh, your closing comments, please. What are we going to do next week? Uh, we, uh, we have not finalized the soft topic yet. We are, we are talk with some students to find out uh, what they can contribute uh, on the behavior they expect from teachers. Uh, I think uh, not being finalized, I will let you know in a couple of days with uh, Dr. Patara. Yeah, no, Thank no. you. So Dr. Arvind, I like uh, Patara said before, we'd really love to have you again uh, on our learning general surgery platform. Uh, we may disturb you in um, uh, a few weeks time. Uh, to talk on some other aspect of uh, thoracic surgery or uh, medical practice in general. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we'll meet again next week. And uh, like, you know, every I Thursday- just got a point. Dr. Vidya, Dr. Yes. Dr. Vidya, before you close, can I, can I just say a big thanks to each one of you for this wonderful opportunity. Trust me, I've enjoyed every second of my stay here. And I humbly thank each and every one of you for the opportunity and also thank each and every one of our colleagues who are watching this program on either of the channels. Thank you. Madam, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arvind. Uh, another thing that uh, everyone who's logged in will learn from you is your humility. And uh, thank you so much. And we'll meet again next Tuesday with uh, another episode of uh, Let's Learn Surgery. Till then, uh, take care and stay safe. Good night. Bye.